Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Odds and Audibles podcast. I'm your host, Jared Mack. Joined with me is Eric Scopel, both from 24-7 Sports, in case you didn't know. And today we kind of have like a little like mix and match, 50-50 mailbag, kind of some news, kind of not some news. Um, where do you want to start this one off with, Eric? What are we thinking here today? Let's do the thing that just happened, which is the AP poll was released like 40 minutes yeah. before we started recording. Um, Ducks was number three. Got a first place vote. Pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. Uh, highest preseason poll for Oregon uh, since 2014. It's obviously the year where they you know, went to the national championship and did all that good stuff. A very, you know, a calendar year for Oregon athletics. Um, this is pretty big news. This is about where I would expect Oregon to be. Um, for some reason, my brain doesn't remember where they were in the coaches poll, which was released like a week or a week and a half ago. They were also three. Thank you, Eric. Um, and that's kind of where, I don't know, going into both of these <clears throat> preseason polls, that's kind of where I expected them to be. I'm not sure there's a whole lot of teams that are better than Oregon, at least on paper going into this season. You know, obviously, you know, you have to play the games or else, you know, everybody would be the preseason favorites, but you have to play the games, but going into the year on paper with all the talent that they've assembled, um, you know, it's hard to see a lot of teams that are just, frankly, better flat out talent wise than Oregon is, at least on paper. I have to imagine, and I'm not, a, neither of us are voters. This is probably the heart, one of the hardest times to vote for these polls with just how much roster churn there is. Like, I was, I was actually talking to my grandma last night over a, a, a nice uh, Marche hamburger over dinner, and she was asking my thoughts on the season. Okay. I was like, Look, fantastic burger, by the way. And mm -hmm. uh, and she was asking me about the team, and I said, well, they're, you know, they're at the time they're number three in the coaches poll, a lot of optimism, and she was really excited and asking some questions. And I said it's harder probably than ever to really know just because so much of this is like almost speculative because this roster we haven't seen these guys play together. So while we totally agree, I'm on board. Obviously, I predicted they'd win every regular season game, um, which these polls feel like good backing. There's some seems like people naturally yeah. think that they have a chance to yeah. do such. Things. But um, like it's still a very hard team to project exactly how this is going to go. And so they're, they're number three. And as you said, the highest since 2014, like you think back to 14, you kind of knew what that Oregon team was. They returned a ton mm -hmm. of starters. They had, you know, a quarterback who had already played in the system for a couple of years, a bunch of skill guys who'd been there. This year's team, this year's team, I think, is going to be awesome, obviously. And, and I think everything we've seen in fall camp is encouraging. But it is one of those like just broadly like oh if there's a lot of things that are, we're going to have to see play out over the course of this season for this ranking to be justified i think we're going to have a really good feel probably by the time they meet ohio state of like okay do they feel like they're capable of, of doing special things yeah. and then once we come out of that game we'll probably have an even better idea but being where they're ranked right now doesn't surprise me at all getting a first place vote that was different that was surprising they, they i'll be honest that one was surprising yeah they didn't get any in the coaches so Somebody out there thinks they're the best team in the country, and I won't necessarily quibble, but uh, I was a little surprised to see it. Yeah, I just have to see it. Um, I mean, I again, like I think they're one of the most talented teams on paper, but like you kind of alluded to, there's we don't have a lot of question marks. We think all these things will go well, but again, we they have to play. Like, what happens if I don't know if Dylan Gabriel just isn't that guy or something like that? You know, like. I don't think that's going to be the case, but these are things that could happen pretty easily on. And, you know, unfortunately for Oregon, they don't necessarily play a really good out of conference schedule. There's not a lot of like really tough competition. I think Boise State's a good, a good program and a good team this year and could be a sleeper team, but you know, it's not going to be the same as when they play Ohio state on the 12th of October. That's going to be a much different thing, but um, still incredibly talented team and i think they should have a really good chance of running the table i think it'll be really difficult especially in the big 10 now but we'll see so i i'm not sure i'm ready to give a prediction or if i have a prediction i'm just kind of going to go with the flow but um they're certainly worth the top three top five ranking wherever you have them and to see them get the first place vote like i said was surprising to me just because there's more continuity on a team like georgia and I won't say oh, there's more continuity on a team like Ohio State because they're very similar to Oregon. They got a lot of big time transfer portal additions who play important positions in their own right. So I, you know, I think Georgia's certainly fine being number one. They, I was, I thought that they were the best team in the country last year. They just happened to lose to Alabama in the SEC championship game. 
that's kind of how life works sometimes. Um, so I'm more than okay seeing them at number one, but I think it's good that Oregon is at, at number three. But I do kind of want to go through the rest of the of the top ten. I don't need to go through the yeah. rest of the the do AP it. poll. Um, for those interested, Iowa's twenty fifth, so that's what it ends with. Um, so I'll go through the the top ten here: Georgia, Ohio State, Oregon, Texas, Bama, Ole Miss, Notre Dame, Penn State, Michigan, and Florida State. It's about right. I don't. There's not. I don't have a lot of gripes here. Notably, only two teams in the whole top twenty five are on Oregon schedule, and they're, and they're the two top ten teams you just listed. I, I was just mm-hmm. taking a peek at okay, did Boise State or Wisconsin or maybe even Washington sneak in? And the answers were no, no, no. They're all kind of in that next receiving votes list. Um, sort mm-hmm. of speaks to the schedule being top heavy. I I agree with you on the top ten. Like, and again, it's hard this time of year. And again, as I said earlier, especially because of the roster churn and how different some of these teams look. But like this feels like what we've been talking about pretty much all summer. Uh, there being yeah. a top four, which is represented by the ones we, that you just ran through there with Georgia, Ohio State, Oregon, and Texas. And then it seems like people really are fascinated by what DeBoer can do at Bama and what this Ole Miss team will be. Ole Miss is going to be fascinating, by the way. Like that's that's yeah, one, of my most, real good. one of my most one of my most anticipated teams to watch. So yeah, it, it, it all felt pretty solid. Um, it does feel strange looking at it and being like there's not and of course this will change over time but there's not like a a middle portion of that schedule in terms of a tier of teams that are ranked like usually you have your marquee games and then you have a couple with teams Mm -hmm. that are start the season kind of in that position to look through it and go like it's ohio state who's number two it's michigan who's number nine and then it falls off a cliff and there's no other top 25 teams yeah yeah i mean in different years you know penn state will be there but that's it for Big Ten teams, I guess. Uh, shoot, you have to include USC now. But, you know, no Iowa, no USC this year, no Penn State this year. So, yeah, really top-heavy. But, you know, I I I like Michigan, and I think their defense is going to be great this year. But, you know, I, it's hard for them to not have a fall-off. I don't know what that means. I don't think it means, like, they're, you know, a 7-5 and five team at the end of the year. But to, to stay with the top 10 – all season long. I think that might be a little bit of a long shot. However, I still think that they're really good. And I still think that their defense can win a lot of games, but um, I'm looking at like the, the 11 through 20 here. And I'm trying to see like what team's going to make a jump or become a, a team that, you know, if Oregon does exactly what they do, like who could they find each other against the, mm-hmm. and, like the college football playoffs. I'm looking at our dear friends, the Utah Utes. Yes, yes. Yeah, I I think Utah is going to trample the Big 12 this year. I, I think that they're going to go in there and, excuse my French, but kick some ass. There we go. That's what, Utah, yeah, that's what Utah has done the last couple of seasons. And Oregon has always matched up really well with them. But Big 12, not necessarily known for their defense. Uh, Utah is. And they've got Cam Rising, who I think might be my age, still playing football. So... <laughs> I, I think they have some advantages. Um, again, this is Kyle Whittingham's last season. So maybe go out on a high note. But I, I look at them and I look at Missouri um, as two schools. Obviously, they're 11 and 12, so I'm not really going out on a limb. But I look at those schools as like teams that could make that jump into the top 10 and and maybe haggle a position or a spot in the poll with Oregon maybe every once in a while. But I really like Utah this year. Kind of my last thoughts on this are, you know, if you're Oregon – and you win the Big Ten, obviously you get the bye. If you don't, you could theoretically play like Utah as the Big Ten champion after their bye week, right? Like I think, or Arizona, who those are like my two Big 12 teams. I'll be kind of just curious on watching former Pac-12 schools that I think are going to be pretty good. Utah, uh, as you said, 11. Arizona, I think 21st or 22nd. Um, mm-hmm. So just keep that in mind. There's a chance that there's a Pac-12 kind of uh, – reunion in the second round of the playoffs and again we're way ahead of ourselves and a lot of things could happen here but if Oregon stumbles to Ohio State let's say in Indy um in a you know a clash of the two of the best teams it's possible Oregon 
hosts a game and then plays like a Utah or an Arizona or something like that in the in the second round. So that's just something just to kind of have in the back of your head as the year goes through. Like we might not be done with these West right. Coast teams playing each other. And I hope we're not. Um, mm-hmm. I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, moving on, going on to our next subject here. Uh, Bo Nix played football. Someone f- not for Oregon, but for the Denver Broncos in a preseason matchup. Um, and I think you just kind of want to talk about Nick's and his performance and him, you know, being in the NFL and playing seemingly pretty well. And then some other guys who got their first taste of preseason action this last weekend. Bo is fun to watch. This was what we expected, right? Like mm-hmm. for as much criticism as there is nationally on like his inability to make the the downfield throws or he's a check down merchant or whatever it is. Yeah, maybe he is those things, but guess what? The offense looked pretty good for Denver. They scored I think four out of the five possessions that he led the offense, they scored either a touchdown or a field goal. He completed 15 of 21 for 125 yards. Yes, that's like six yards per pass attempt. That's not real explosive, but the offense moved. He completed the passes. He made good decisions. Like this is sort of what I expected to see from Bo, but it was, it was, it was fun to watch it transpire and to see, frankly, a lot of like positive takeaways. I know there are still people kind of, pointing to what I pointed to to start, which is like, oh, he's just yeah. hitting the check down. But hitting the check down works. We talked we talked about this last year while this was happening in Oregon of like the offense is really, really good. And part of it is because he just he's going to take, the you know, the, the free three or four yards every time that's presented to him. So I thought he looked great. It was really fun watching, by the way, for those who got a chance, like Denver, the Alex Forsyth Bo Nix reunion there at the, for the center quarterback exchange. You had Troy Franklin out there at times, Calvin Throckmorton, um, Hunter Campmoyer. Like the Denver offense has a ton of former Ducks, only a couple mm-hmm. of which actually played together. But um, yeah, I thought it was great. And it sounds like he, I, I really, you know, he was, I think, number three on their first depth chart that they put out a week or so ago. Yeah, but that Sean Payton came enough. out and said, John Payton came out and said all rookies are third on the depth chart. So, I was gonna say, regardless that, of position. That's so. that's not lasting. He's he looks like the best quarterback they have. So we'll see what happens. But I, I think he's he's on the right track to to starting week one. Yeah, for anybody who doesn't follow the NFL who's listening, like Broncos quarterback situation isn't isn't great. No. Uh you know, obviously Russell Wilson is in Pittsburgh. Uh if you're just tuning into the NFL and you found that out from me, I'm sorry. Um, but Russell Wilson is no longer in Denver. Um, three three quarterbacks played uh, this past preseason game for Denver. It was Bo Nix, obviously, Zach Wilson, and then Jared Siddham. Um, two Auburn legends and a BYU legend. So mm-hmm. that's something to take away. But uh, Nix was the best of the bunch. Uh, Zach Wilson was 10 of 13 for 117 yards. So I don't know what the competition really is. It's probably a competition between all three of them. But Nix is, um, he's a rookie, but he's really experienced. Obviously, he, he was five years in college, played a million starts, played in a lot of tough environments. Um, to Eric's point of like, you know, the three yard, the four yard, the dink and dumps, like, that's fine. Um, like, I'd rather have that in an offense than somebody who just doesn't know how to handle uh, handle a football and just throws in a double coverage and things like that. And I think that was the point all season long was he took what the defense gave him and that gave him, got him yards. And, you know, if you're face, if you're first down, you get four yards every time. That's a lot. That's a lot better than getting zero yards or one yard every time. So I never got the bonex hate uh, in terms of he's a check down merchant and things like that. It's like he's making the right read. Like other things are covered and he's throwing it to his outlet because you want to get yards. I, that's more or less the, the offensive perspective for everybody in the NFL and college football is you want to gain yards and move down the field. So. That's beside the point. I thought he played well. I thought the offense under Sean Payton will will probably kind of orchestrate to his strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Um, I agree. He will be tested in the NFL. I don't know if he was really tested all that often last year at Oregon in terms of his ability to throw down the field. Like, you know, if I were an NFL defense, I would just sit down and cover the flats and cover anything like underneath 10 yards and then force him to beat me deep. And once he can show that, then – yeah, then then he can become an NFL quarterback. But until he does, and that's probably not going to happen until the regular season when he's playing real NFL players, no disrespect for, for those playing in the preseason, but not everybody's playing in the preseason as we're all well and aware. Um, so we'll see eventually, but I still have high hopes for Bo, and I think he could be a solid NFL quarterback. 
Bucky Irving fell in the uh, end zone on Saturday, by the way, as well. Just like there were several Oregon players scoring their first touchdowns, which was fun. Um, I'll be curious on Bucky of like what sort of a role this ends up. He's not Rashad White's mm-hmm. going to be their starting running back, but it really feels like I feel like Bucky's going to be involved, and to what degree yeah. we'll find out. So I like this is going to be kind of a fun year with some some fan favorites out there. Troy's fall has been kind of like not the most positively regarded from everything I've seen. He did not catch a pass um, from Bo. We'll see. It's again, it's, it was just the first preseason game. I don't want to make too much out of it, but like I'm just running through now the list of names of guys that that were drafted. Um, Evan Williams forced a fumble uh, also on Saturday with the Packers. So some positive kind of first impressions from Oregon rookies uh, so far in preseason, which again, there's still a couple weeks left for that to kind of get a sense before you get to the season and the rosters are finalized and all that fun stuff. So I, again, Bo, Bo played really well. I thought Bucky obviously had a nice little game there and would have liked to see more from Troy, but maybe that'll come later. Yeah, I don't think it'll come later. Um, like you said, it's the first preseason game. Like It's okay if he didn't catch one. It would have been really cool if he did, but um, he just didn't. And <laughs> I'm a big fan of, of Bucky Irving wherever he's going to go. I think he's going to be an impact back. Um, I get why NFL teams were maybe not high to pick him like in the second or third round, given his production. Like He was probably a second or third round draft pick. But his athleticism scores in the combine just weren't – they weren't great. They weren't what you want from a second or third round running back, and I understand that. But I think he's just going to be really productive wherever he goes because he's a, you know, as a hard runner. He's hard to bring down. He's, like, shifty for a guy his size. And, oh, yeah. Um, like, I don't know if he'll ever be a bell cow, like a true number one, but I think he can really carve out a nice career for himself as, like, a number two or maybe being a number one if somebody gets injured. But – I think there's probably always going to be a more talented, athletically, physically gifted running back than Bucky Irving on a team. But that's okay. Like, I think he could still have a nice long career as a running back in the NFL. And um, he looks great in those Buccaneers uniforms, too. I hate to say it. I love, I love those things. Same. And and Bucky playing for the Bucks. There's going to be... There's going to be some play on words there, for sure. I know. So, anyway, f- it was fun watching these guys. Um, we'll have... I don't know how many more times we'll talk about what happens in the preseason from here. Justin Herbert not playing at all in the preseason, by the way, because of that. I think it's a foot injury or, or plantar lower. fascia. Yeah, yeah. So just keep it. Just keep that kind of in the back of your head if you turn on the Chargers and you see a lot of uh, what is it, Easton, Easton Stick, Stick. Yeah, I was going to say Street. But I knew that was wrong. Um, so yeah, but uh, yeah, it's it's it, it's fun having some some football. I'll put it that way. That was that was a nice little. A nice little enjoying way to finish out the weekend after the Olympics concluded on Sunday morning. Well, we're going to hit the break. And when we come back, we're going to do a couple mailbag questions and wrap up this Monday podcast. All right. Welcome back in. We are here to do a couple mailbag questions. Like I said before the break, um, Eric wasn't the best, you know, inventory of questions here, but. We're not complaining. We're very happy that all of you guys sent them in. Um, If you want to reach us more directly on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, please use the hashtag Odds and Audibles podcast. Makes it way easier for us to find it. Um, But Eric, what do we got on the docket today? Yeah, we're jumping into everything. This is, uh, uh, as you said, maybe not the deepest in terms of questions. We only got three this morning, but uh, there's some fun ones. We'll start with this one, which... I guess just gives us an opportunity to talk about a scrimmage from at Duck Fan Dan. Are sure. you worried that the first scrimmage was not won by defense or offense? Hashtag thoughts and audibles. No. And by the way, it very much could have been won by the offense or defense. We don't have any sense of really what happened based upon our conversation with Dan. Dan just was like, no, it wasn't won by either side. <laughs> Which players were good? No idea. Dan didn't want to talk about it. No, Whittington did play. We know Dylan Gabriel did play and had a good command of the offense. These are just things mm-hmm. that we know from Dan. And again, we don't actually know. We're just taking his word for it. Um, this is a close scrimmage. What else is there? Uh, offense and defense both had red zone success. There was one turnover. Um, yes. there's some, some, crit- some critical kicks made some missed. And, uh, he would have liked to have seen, I think the pre snap stuff a little better. So that's kind of the, yeah. the rundown. So, uh, to answer the question, no, not really. Cause I really don't know what happened or have 
much to take away from it other than what Dan said in a, a three minute interview, which he would probably even acknowledge he's just not going to give much information on. So um, not worried at all. Uh, don't really know what to take from the scrimmage other than it happened. And some guys did take part. Yeah, it did happen. Um, <clears throat> Dan also mentioned that Noah Whittington took part in the scrimmage. So that's a positive. Um, we're never going to find out how somebody actually did in the scrimmages until probably like today or tomorrow when, a player just inadvertently says somebody did a really good thing at the scrimmage and we're all like, oh, did he now? Um, when it's Dan post scrimmage, we're not going to get a single thing. And that's fine. You know, like he's for whatever reason, I don't I don't understand it. But you know, for whatever reason, Dan is not going to give any information about scrimmages, um, even though we can probably all guess who did pretty well on both sides of the ball, probably like their best players or something like that. However, it doesn't matter that neither the defense or the offense won the scrimmage. Um, it's the first scrimmage of fall camp. It'll get better. It'll get more competitive as time goes on. Uh, Dan did say that he was kind of, I can't, I can't remember the word he used, but I'm, I'm going to say frustrated. Frustrated by like the pace. He wants to see that pick up better, um, which is kind of like the pre-snap adjustments that Eric was mentioning. And yeah, that seemed to be like his biggest takeaway, or at least my biggest takeaway. Like there wasn't, he didn't give us anything that he really didn't like or really liked. He had to the the pre snap stuff and trying to get the tempo up was I thought was interesting. I don't really think that they went too high tempo last year. I don't think that they're going to go high tempo this year. It wouldn't really make much sense going into the Big Ten and trying to do that stuff. But maybe that's how they find an advantage in a matchup or something like that, where they do go like high high tempo at one point during a game. But no, the scrimmage happened, and that was about it. So you're, I could see there being a matchup or two where they do change pace in terms of trying to go faster in the right circumstances. And again, this is going to be matchup dependent, but maybe there's a defense right. where they go, okay, they're a little slower. They like to make a lot of, you know, like, like Oregon who makes a ton of substitutions, like it's defensive line. I think mm -hmm. the, the, they want, they don't want anyone playing more than like 40% of the snaps on the defensive line is I think the figure Dan's talked about. So maybe they find a team, out there this year that has a similar strategy and they say we're going to go tempo and force these guys to stay on the field but i i also agree like i don't think that's like part of their base offense like this isn't chip kelly 12 years ago no. this is this is a different era of oregon football um i don't have a whole lot else to say on the scrimmage that really yeah, isn't I got much else. um we, i will acknowledge they have two more scrimmages this fall they have one this saturday and then one the following saturday and guess what the saturday after that they play a football game inside Autzen Stadium that we all will get to watch against Idaho on August 31st. So um, it's crazy. We're that close. I just wish we had a little bit more to share in terms of what we've seen and who we think are good based upon anything other than coaches' comments and past success. Because at this point, we don't really have a lot other than like Poncho pancaked a guy like on one of the practices that we watched. And right. I was like, wow, that's exciting. Um, so that's that's kind of where we are right now for fall camp. Um, yeah, let's scoot on down to the second question from at Snyder Jordan. The defense last season was 11th in points per game allowed and 22nd in yards per game facing some very dynamic quarterbacks. Could you guys see this defense being top five, maybe even pushing for the number one spot this season? Hashtag odds and audibles. Thank you, Jordan, for the question. Um, this is going to be kind of an interesting shift here, by the way, because. Jordan makes a good point. I, I, I was just thinking about this a couple of days ago, looking at the conference. Who's like the best quarterback Oregon faces, Jared? Like, who would you say? Like, just like the first name that comes to your head that, that's on the schedule. It's Howard, right? Probably. Yeah, Ohio State. But the fact that there's not one that just like leaps out and it's like, oh, it's Caleb Williams or, oh, it's Michael Penix yeah. or, oh, it's Shador yeah. Sanders or whoever, you know? Cam Ward, like there were all these great quarterbacks in the schedule last year. So there is going to be a shift. There's also going to be a bit of a shift in offensive philosophy. Um, the other part here is does Oregon's offense score as much as it did in the past? And how does that, because I don't think they will in this conference. And how does that impact the number of possessions, the number of opportunities the opposing defense gets? Because I think that was a little bit of last year's success was like, when Oregon's offense was scoring the way it was and the leads they built, it forced the opponent to play not necessarily to their strengths or at least play from behind. Like, is Oregon going to just rush out to 28 nothing leads against 
all the mediocre teams. Maybe they still will. Um, but I think that could play a role in it. So um, there isn't aren't dynamic quarterbacks. They do play some really good running backs. They play some very strong offensive lines. There's still a lot of talent they'll face in this conference. I could see the numbers improve. Number one feels like a real stretch for me. Mm -hmm. um, top five, I think, is is probably attainable just because I, I don't know. Like, I was even going through, like, who are, like, the four best quarterbacks? And it's probably Will Howard. It's probably Aiden Childs, who literally hasn't been a starter before. And that's just purely off of talent and what he was as a recruit and some small snippets at Oregon State. It's probably Tyler Van Dyke, who – is he good? I don't know. I don't know. And it's probably Will Rogers at Washington, who, again, I don't know. So all these guys yeah, are at new schools. All, all four at new schools and new offenses. All of them are transfer quarterbacks. Two of them are maybe guys with some NFL juice going forward, just depending upon how they develop. So the quarterback stuff is favorable, Jared. Go ahead. Sorry. I I, I talked too long on that probably. No, no, no. You're good. Um, it's going to be really hard to be the number one overall defense. I think it's just as simple as saying that. Yeah, yeah. Um, like – and if they're again, if the number eleven, I don't think anybody was really complaining about the defense last season, other than the two games against Washington. And like, you put Washington literally against any defense, um, that's going to be a tough matchup last season, specifically because of just the talent that they had at quarterback and wide receivers. But Oregon was pretty damn good, other than those games. Like they held more than half their opponents last year to ten or fewer points. You know how hard that is? Ten or fewer points. And again, we can go through the quarterbacks that they played against. Even, yeah, I don't know. Even some of the games were, you know, Shador Sanders was held to seven points. Like, there were some games where the quarterback play wasn't great, but it wasn't terrible. And they still held to, to, to under ten points. Um, and that was with a pass secondary that wasn't great. Like they had good moments. Like I thought Kyrie Jackson had really good moments, but was he was really banged up a lot. And Jaleel Florence obviously missed the Oregon State game and the Pac-12 championship game and the bowl game. Like they were banged up. They didn't have as much depth or talent as they do now. So they clearly improved there. So if there is a way to get to that number one spot or top five or whatever, whatever you really want it to be, it's certainly through the secondary where they improved a lot. And they bring back Taishim, they get Jabbar Muhammad, Cam Alexander. We'll see what Jaleel Florence looks like once he's finally healthy, whenever that may be. Um, I just think their outside coverage is going to be a lot better than it was last season. It's just going to come down to can they stop the run like they did last year? Because they were one of the best rush defenses in the conference up there with Utah. And then at the same time, they were one of the best rush defenses in the country because of how good Utah like they were under you know 80 yards for a long time during the season they got gashed a little bit towards the end I think that's kind of just wear and tear but if they can replicate that kind of success against Big Ten offenses who as we've talked about as many people know like to run the ball more often than not like it's gonna be a really good defense because they're gonna put teams in a third down and long scenarios they're going to let their pass rushers like Uyungle and Birch and Harmon and Caldwell go to work on a pass rush and just say, you know, we feel confident with our secondary and the guys that we added. They understand the defense. Like, good luck, because a lot of the teams that Oregon play, is playing this year not only might not have the same quarterback talent as they did last season in the Pac-12, but they certainly don't have the same wide receiver talent as they did last year in the Pac-12. So. I think it could be an advantageous position for Oregon as long as they can stop the run. And I don't know. I think I'm pretty confident that they will be able to. I just haven't seen it. And until I see it, I, I'm just going to say I feel confident, but we'll find out because it's just a, sometimes it's just a different ball game. And Oregon has done really well the last couple of seasons, actually, in their rush defense. But we all remember what happened when they played Oregon State, a team that was – really physical, really run dominant, and was more than willing to never throw a pass again. And they might run into that once or twice in the Big Ten this year. So we'll see. But I think the potential is there. Number one, I just I can't say that it'll, it'll ever happen. The one thing I'd say on number one, and again, I think it's a long 
a long shot is who is like, is there a de facto, like we know this defense is absolutely incredible. Like Michigan, Michigan Michigan's interior defensive line and its secondary is really good. I think Ohio there's, State. there's just some pieces that they're putting together. I, Cause I'm just saying, cause in the past, like you had those yeah. Georgia defenses where it was like, Holy, holy I mean, shit. Georgia, like, yeah. <laughs> Georgia's got some questions. on going to be good line. this year too. And I'm not saying, or I just, there's not like my, my, my point was, cause you bring up some good defenses and Michigan was the first one I thought of to be clear, but um when you're doing this exercise like even when you were doing the oh can can should dylan gabriel really be the heisman favorite i think the yeah. reason he's up there is because it's not like oh this incredible once in a generation type of talent is there at quarterback maybe i'll look silly coming down the stretch of the season i don't mm -hmm. know if there's a defense quite like that even though michigan still has a lot of the pieces especially its interior defensive line and its secondary that are really really special so that would be the thing to bring up and then just to kind of piggyback off your your rush comment there Two the two of their biggest losses have been in part because they just weren't as good against the run you mentioned the oregon state one which was just a colossal failure and still like the most inexplicable loss in a while for an oregon team the other one was the pactal championship game where we want to give yeah. michael Penix all the credit and he deserves it because he played really well in that game but i thought it was dylan johnson and their offensive line that really set the tone early in las vegas in that game where their first couple of drives were you didn't even need Penix to be all that successful throwing the football. No, it, was, no. it was it was through the run game. So I agree that that would be kind of where I'd be focused in because we do know, like, I think Oregon secondary is ready to shut down a lot of these pass attacks. We think this defensive line is really good. We think these line. I feel the most like the most continuity on this defense is at linebacker. To be clear, from last year, mm -hmm. and I feel really good about Bossa and Jacobs. But let's see how they fare against. A little bigger offensive lines, and as I said, like Ohio State brings incredible running back pair into Otson and, and Boise State. I know it's not a Big Ten team. Ashton Gianti is like what third, fourth, fifth best running back I in the country. That kid. He's, He's awesome. So, good. so they're going to face some really tough run games. Let's see how they hold up. I think that will determine where they're at. I think we're both saying like top five could be a possibility. Number one feels like a real stretch. Um, and if we're having a conversation about number one defense anytime in October or further in the season we know the season's going really, really, really well. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. I will say, um, you know, like Dan Lanning's last year at Georgia with like the, you know, the one of the best defenses ever, if not the best statistical defense in college football history. They obviously had lots of talent and everybody knew that they would be pretty good. Nobody knows how good the team's defense or offense is until they play the games. And then that unit is so cohesive and whatever they're doing, that it's just really simple and easy for them. And I'm not saying that'll be the case with Oregon's defense. I still have some concerns with the interior defensive line depth. But once they get out there on the field, I think we'll know pretty quickly within the first game or two how this defense responds to any type of adversity or how they just are cohesive on the field. Because I think I, we saw that last season in like the first two games. It was like, this defense is going to be much different than it was the year before. Like they are flying to the ball. There's there's multiple hats on a head, and I think we'll we'll find that out pretty quick. But to, for again for like a top ten defense, I don't know why anybody wouldn't just take like number eight or number nine. Like I'm cool with that. If you want to do number one, be my guest. But I, I think that uh, shooting for a top ten defense is is more likely than anything else. Who do you? This is a uh, not in the show notes. Do we feel better about the offense or the defense, just like broadly? I'm not even saying where they finish, but like what which side of the ball are we like more confident being elite or dominant this year? I probably think the, the offense. Probably the offense. Yeah. It's hard to be really good defensively. It it's really true. is. And offensively, they just have weapons. They just have dudes. Like I I know that Oregon has dudes on the defensive end. I just I think it might be I you know I've seen Tez Johnson catch almost 90 passes for 1200 yards in a season. I've seen Jordan James be an absolute menace. I've seen this offensive line like 90% of it ruin people's lives on the opposing defensive line. I I just feel like I've seen more of them and so in my brain I think it's the it's the offense, but there's obviously a lot of good dudes on the defense. I just I'm going to give it to the offense cuz it is a little easier to be better. At, at offense and defense 
And the offense had fewer holes almost to fill, other than obviously the most important position, which is quarterback, which we think they've done a great job. But there were just a bunch of spots right. on defense. That would be my answer, too. All right, last one from at Ross underscore Maselich. Where does Oregon turn for O-line and tight end recruits for 2025 after missing out on Aaron Dunn and Desan Brame decommitting? Hashtag Otts and Audibles. Thank you for all three question askers. Use the hashtag. We appreciate that. As Jared said earlier, it does make it easier to find. Um, well, they're kind of in a weird spot at tight end, if I'm honest. I'm not super concerned about the offensive line. They've got three commits. I think they're all good players. We can talk about them if we want. Oregon hosted... I think three of the top five tight ends in the country in the month of June. And they went initially, they went one for three and now they're zero for three after brain flipped to Tennessee a couple weeks ago. Um, I think it's a little bit concerning. I also feel like in the portal era, you can really make up for recruiting shortcomings pretty easily. You know, I mean, not, not in the long term, but they could go out there and get a guy with two years of eligibility next year, theoretically, who's a starting caliber player who can come in and kind of fill in for what you would have gotten with a brain or somebody like that. So I I think some of it gets mitigated, but it doesn't feel great when you host all the top guys, basically, and none of them choose to go to your school. Um, And at a position where you're losing two of your top three tight ends, there's only a couple of true freshmen behind Kenyon Sadiq. Like there's not a lot of guys that we know about at this position. So I, I think it's warranted to be a little concerned. Um, Oregon did just go out and offer Andrew Olesh from Pennsylvania, the number four ranked tight end. He is a Michigan commitment. I'm sure that's going to be a tough one to flip. Um, I'm sure they'll stay on a guy like Brame, a Lincoln Cure, Caleb Edwards. These are the other tight ends they hosted. The top rated player in the state of Oregon is Barrett Nainone, who's a tight end committed to Washington. So there are some options here. Uh, barring a flip from another one of these top prospects, though, it's going to be it's going to be kind of seen as a bit of a disappointing run, considering how many of these guys they, they already got out to campus and, and to miss on them. So, I don't know, Jared. Do you have any other thoughts on? I know the question was about names. I kind of ran through mm-hmm. a couple yeah, that you, you should probably keep names. an eye on, but like, where are you at with tight end recruiting? Because, like I said, I I don't ever want to make it like an alarm bells. Oh, this is really terrifying. They're screwed. They're not going to be able to field the team now but it is a little bit concerning when you host all these top guys and you just don't get them. Yeah. You know, this has been a topic of discussion on this show previously about Drew Maringer and his ability to recruit tight ends. Hasn't really gone well. Um, Obviously Kenyon Sadiq is a good prize. It's good consolation, but Mm -hmm. you know, he, he hasn't played like, I don't know what he, what he is yet. We all have high hopes for him, and there's a lot of, you know, he's certainly the uh, on the most helium right now of anybody on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, yep. Roger Saliopaga and A.J. Pugliano are going to be absolute non-factors this year. There's no way either of those two kids see the field just because they're not ready to play the tight end position physically. And Oregon, despite all the flashy stuff from Bo and Bucky and Troy last year and Tez Johnson, all these huge explosive plays, when push comes to shove, they like to shove. Mm-hmm. They like to get in 12 and 13 personnel sets. That's why they went and got Casey Kelly last year. So in a year from now, when, when Terrence Ferguson and Patrick Herbert are no longer here, and your biggest tight end is Kenyon Sadiq, who's six foot four, 245 pounds, and isn't really a shover, this is going to be a problem. And I've been talking about this for years now, and people think I'm probably crazy. But Oregon's tight end room is heavily relied on even if they're not catching passes. And that's why Herb is such a good good guy. That's why Casey Kelly really helped last year. And that's why Terrence Ferguson is ginormous of a human. That's why they still miss Cam McCormick, frankly, in their 12 or 13 sets, even though Cam is literally my age. <laughs> so when it comes to flipping guys, Olesh is a, is a good prospect. Don't get me wrong, but he's from Pennsylvania. My eyes are on Caleb Edwards as a guy who was a potential commit only because he's a California kid committed to somewhere in the SEC. And that gives Oregon at least some proximity connection thing. Hey, you don't have to go so far away. Like it's an hour and a half plane ride from Southern California, Eugene, blah, 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 stuff like that. Things where 
you know, that, that, that the opposite of that has hurt Oregon in the past where they have a commit from Kansas, AKA Desan Brain goes to a school that is closer, I guess, by proximity. So I think that could be an option just because of proximity location. If Oregon had to really push all their chips into somebody, um, a tight end in this 2025 class, because the only guy who's not committed is the 19th tight end in the class, Dakota Terrell. He's from Oklahoma. Um, I don't think Oregon's even, Oregon's not even offered. No. Right. And, so it's either him as an uncommitted guy or the 41st tight end in the country. Everybody's locked up right about now. And maybe this will be a, a real issue. Maybe it really won't be. I'm leaning on it probably won't be because of the transfer portal like you mentioned. Yeah. But you still have to recruit those guys too. So yeah. I don't know. It's interesting tight end recruiting has certainly been a topic of discussion on this podcast before and how it hasn't really been great. Um, I don't think that's going anywhere, especially with everybody and their mother who's a good tight end already committed in the 25 class, but we'll see. We'll see. It kind of gives Oregon the opportunity to like shoot the moon here though, in the portal of like, yeah. of like selling yeah. someone. I'm like, you can come in and literally be, a humongous factor because there's nobody else here. We've got Sadiq. We've got a couple of true freshmen. We've got X recruit who, unless they do flip one of these guys is probably a lesser player. Let's come in here. You can be a huge part of this offense. So maybe, maybe that actually helps in a weird way, your portal pitch. I'm not sure how many portal guys are worried about true freshmen to be fair. Yeah. Um, just, just kind of thinking out loud on, on where they're at there. Offensive line. I actually think I'm, I'm pretty in on what they've done. Losing out on Dunn was a bummer um i really liked his tape but they've got zaire addison who i really like we talked about him they've got alai kalani avalu who is going to be a jackson powers johnson type of prospect um a little down the road though i think he's, he's taking his mission and they've got uh dimitri manning from up in the state of washington who i'm very curious about as just a yeah. huge person we've seen him at, at snl's camp last year he's like legit six seven three fifty like this is another not quite shack build, but like in that kind of physical realm of human beings, like just big boys. Mm -hmm. um, so I like that. It would have been great to have closed on one of these tackles um, in terms of options still available. Austin Pay from Utah was an offensive tackle who visited in June. He is uncommitted. Another high upside piece. I think landing him would be fine. He's a three star prospect. It's going to hurt your blue chip rate because Oregon currently has 15 commits and 14 are four or five stars, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, and then the biggest name to know that's like kind of on the board, but I don't really know if Oregon's going to be able to close just because he's announcing soon. And my understanding is they're kind of on the outside looking in would be Michael Fasusi from Texas, who is a five star on the number three offensive tackle in the country. Um, I think that feels like a bit of a long shot. I've also felt like some other five-star recruits Oregon has been involved with were long shots, and yet they ended up picking Oregon. So maybe it comes together. Regardless, I'm not like – like the success of past classes along the offensive line, I know there are still some gaps that they're going to probably have to fill. Like, Jared, who's the, who's Oregon's left tackle next year if Josh Connerly goes? Like it's – I don't even know. I think Rodgers? I think he's a right tackle, but maybe he's a left tackle. And if you take yeah. him out, like, I mean, it's just it's just tough. So – but again, the portal fixes all of this stuff. So that I, I think in general, though, the offensive line's in a pretty good spot. And I do like the prospects that they've gotten. It would have been nice to see them close on a couple of these guys to kind of fill things out. But I'm not I'm not really all that concerned long term along the offensive line. And again, the portal stuff just kind of it's the ultimate solve for when you've got a gap here, a gap there. So yeah, um, I don't know. Is there any other names or anything else you wanted to say on the offensive line recruiting? Because again, Oregon still is a great class. Yeah. Three really highly regarded O linemen committed. Yeah, no, I mean, you can never have too many offensive linemen. At least that's what I think. That's my perspective on recruiting like that. Three is a good start. I think they'll probably add one or two more. I don't know who they're going to be because recruiting is really fluid and it can be really volatile as well. Just in kids you know, committing and then a month and a half later decommitting and flipping elsewhere. Maybe Oregon gets a signing day commit. Um, I don't know because that's in February. That's so long from now. And I feel like this class is interesting, specifically the 25. So I feel like everything is really expedited in this class. Like it had been 
moving in that direction of like, hey, we're going to like all the quarterbacks are all committed by June or July. And like that, that started to happen, you know, two, three years ago. This year, it feels like anybody who's anybody in this class is committed already. And season hasn't started. It's August. Like, I feel like it's kind of expedited. I don't think it's caught Oregon by surprise. I'd be really surprised if it did catch them. It's just there's a long time. There's still official visits for everybody, not just for Oregon, but official visits for game days. A lot of opportunities for any school across the country to make their case to a kid. So it wouldn't surprise me to see if there was more de- decommits. Now, I'm not going to be a UW guy and say it's the year of the decommit for the 15th straight year. However, there's a chance. I saw a stat today that I think it was from uh, Brandon Marstello, who works at 24 7 Sports, who said, 18%, 18.8% of all 2025 commits have already decommitted at one point. So it's interesting. Wow. Again, not saying it's the year of the decommit. I'm not, you know, never mind. It could happen. It could happen to a lot of schools and not just for Oregon's sake. Um, it's just it's just early right now. We'll see what happens. It's weird to say it's early, but it is. And I say that because, uh, to your point, like you just look through the five stars that are uncommitted right now, and it's like five out of 32 guys. Like, yeah. it's, they're like, everyone's already decided. It feels mm-hmm. like in Oregon, it's going to take, but it sounds like a, a little bit of a smaller class. I'll be curious to see, like, what does the move to 105 scholarships do for all this? Like, that's, that's by the way, just like the elephant in the room in all of this is like, if they go to 105 next year, like how, what happens? Like there's going to be a lot of different pieces yeah, that fall into know. place. And that might be a good time to have on somebody nationally, whether it be a Chris Hummer or Brandon Marcello to just kind of run through kind of what they think the outcome of all this is going to be. Cause I'm, I'm fascinated. Dan has talked a little bit about it. Um, I thought Lorik's comments. Now we're going off on a tangent about special teams was really interesting just about how, yep. Oh yeah. You think you're going to, they're going to be more specialists. He's like, I think it's going to be the opposite. We currently carry like nine basically specialists, a, a punter, a kicker and a lot and, and long snappers. Like we're only probably going to be able to carry two for each position as opposed to three, like they do now. So um, it, it, it's going to be really interesting to see how that impacts things. But I think this will be a smaller class for Oregon, a really talented one. Mm-hmm. But to your point, you look around, there's just not a lot of uncommitted prospects that they're still targeting or guys that visited. Like I think uncommitted prospects that have visited, I believe there are, are three left. Michael Terry, mm-hmm. Jonah Williams, a couple of five stars, and then Austin Pay, that offensive tackle I spoke about earlier. So from a target list perspective that are at least guys you wouldn't be flipping, it's just a really short list right now. Yeah. And that does it. All right. That's it for this edition of the Odds and Audibles podcast. I hope everybody enjoyed who is listening or watching. Um, Either or, please leave a review, leave a comment on YouTube, leave a five-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, And for Eric Scopel, I'm Jared Mack. Thank you for listening. Talk to you later, folks.